Hello, Calc Kids. This is Mr. Bean from FlipMath.com. Today, we're going to look at the 2022 AP Calculus free response question for the number two of the AB test. So this first one, remember, this is a calculator because number one and two are calculator problems. So we can use calculators to help us. And this first part says, find the area of the region enclosed by the graphs F and G. And you have to understand which one is F and which one is G. They didn't give that to us. So you have to know which one is which. Hopefully you can recognize that this x to the fourth is a polynomial and it's gonna have some curves in it as opposed to the natural log of x plus three, which is just shifted left. The natural log of x curve, I should say, is shifted left. So this one's my f, this one's my g. Now that's important because we have to know which one is above the other one in order to find the area. So the area between two curves is represented by an integral and we're gonna go from the lower boundary to the upper boundary. So the question is, this intersection point and this intersection point, what are those? They give us the two of them. We know that x equals negative two. So that one right there is x equals negative two. That's the lower one. And then the top one is b, but I don't know what b is. So that's where we grab our calculator and find the point of intersection. So there's my calculator. I labeled the first one f is in the is y1. The second one is in y2, the polynomial. And if I do a standard window, Zoom six is my standard window. Then you get a graph like this. I'm zoomed out a bit, but what I really care about is where does it cross right there at that point? So I'm gonna do a calculate my intersection, first curve, second curve, and yes, right about, whoops, right about there. Where does it cross? All right, point, let's drag this over here. So that's going to happen when the this point right here, so I'm gonna say B is approximately this long thing. And now what, because I've done it like that, now I can refer to B here and I don't have to rewrite this whole thing. In fact, for the rest of the problem, anytime I refer to B, I can just use the letter B because I've already said what it equals. Now on the calculator, after I find that point of intersection, I'm gonna second quit, go back to the main screen and I wanna store that answer. Store my answer as, let's do alpha B, just to stay consistent with B, hit enter, and then boom. Okay, now I've got the calculator remembering it as B. So let's go back here and set up my integral, my integral is going to be from negative two to b, uh, and then the first function was f, that's the one that's on top, the larger function, and I'm subtracting the one that's below it, and that is with respect to x. So that will give me the area that is enclosed between f and g, and then I just go one more step, plug that in my calculator, round to, or truncate to three decimals, math nine, negative two, up to alpha b, and then because I'm just plugging in what was in Y1 and Y2, this is where the calculator skills come in. I use my Y variables, Y1, subtract my variables button, go over to Y, down here to Y2, and then I do it all with respect to X. Enter, and there we go, 3.603 if I was truncating, four if I was rounding, so I'm just gonna put four decimals so you can see either one of those is the answer. All right, that is the area of the region. And if you weren't sure how to do this one, you could refer to lesson 8.4. And 8.4 for calculus, let's look at flipmath.com, 8.4 right there, area between curves with respect to x. That's the lesson that teaches you how to do part A. All right, let's go on to part B. For this problem, they tell us that h of x is going to be a vertical distance between f and g. I'll label that again, that one's f. That one's G. And so it's just the vertical distance. I drew this little red line right here to represent the vertical distance. And it's, it's as you move across, that H, this line, is going to get smaller or larger. So the question is, as you're moving, right at X equals negative 0.5. So right about here, we would have that red line. Let me draw a new red line. So something that looks like that. So at that moment, is H increasing or decreasing? And that should be a big thing here. When you say these, these words increasing or decreasing, that should ju just jump out at you. You're trying to figure out if the derivative is positive or negative. So what we want is, is H prime positive or negative? Well, let's do this first. I should write out what is H equal? Well, H is just the distance between the two. So it's going to be F of X minus G of X. So the derivative of H is going to be F prime minus g prime. And then we just want to know, is that positive or is that negative at the point when x is negative 0.5? So you could do this by hand. You could take the derivative of these by hand and then plug in the negative 0.5, but we do have a calculator that we can use, so it's probably a little faster. Now there's several ways we can use the calculator to find that. So I'll show you what I'm going to do, what I'm going to enter. 
So you can see here, if you look carefully, I'm taking the derivative of the first function, which was my f, minus the derivative of the second function, which was my g, and I'm just evaluating them at negative 0.5. So if I do all that, that spits the, out the answer of 0.5999999. Okay, so there is a little bit of a rounding error for the calculator. So that is going to be negative 0.6. So we'll round that one up, and we get negative 0.6. So what does that tell us? Is h increasing or decreasing? h is decreasing. So we can say this distance from f to g, or we can just say h is decreasing. And now here's the reason why. Because h prime, oh, I should say is h is decreasing at x equals negative 0.5. There we go, that's a little bit better. h is decreasing at x equals negative 0.5 because h prime of negative 0.5 is negative. So you could write out is negative, or you could just say is less than zero. Both of those would work right there. Okay, part B is done. And if you weren't sure how to do that one, you could look back at lesson 5.3. 5.3, and there are links in the description of the video to get you to 5.3. What's 5.3 called? 5.3, my calculus is down here. 5.3, determining intervals at which a function is increasing or decreasing. In this case, it wasn't actually an interval, it was just a point. So it's a little easier than an interval. All right, on to part C. Ah, uh, cross sections. They always tend to give us some cross sections. Now the cross sections here is uh, perpendicular to the x-axis. So we're going to do it with respect to x. That does make this a little bit easier. And the cross section is a square. Oh, we got the easiest type of cross section. Hopefully you did okay on this one. Uh, here's how this works. We need the area of one cross section. So it's kind of like I had that line that's going up and down right here. The area of one cross section. And you remember it's coming off the paper here towards us and it's making a square. That is a horrible square. Okay, something like that. It's going like off the paper there towards us. So that area is going to create, the, a whole bunch of these slices is gonna create a volume all across this. So the volume is going to equal, and I'm do, going to do this entire part here. I'm gonna go do negative two to B. And I've already said what B is back on part, part uh, A. So I've already said that right, right here, B. And then it is the area of the cross section. So that's what goes right here. The area of the cross section with respect to x. So what is the area of the cross section? It's just a square. So it is this thing squared. So it's that length, which was our h, right? So it's f of x minus g of x squared. So let's just put the squared right here. Okay, so f of x minus g of x quantity squared. That will give me the volume. And from here, you just plug that whole thing into a calculator, and you're going to get that the volume is... There's the whole thing plugged in. Be careful that I got the quantity squared. And what's my answer? 5.340. There we go. Three decimal places. Okay, that's the volume. Now we're... Oh, and what was this lesson if you didn't know how to do this one? This is lesson 8.7. What's that one called? 8.7. We go to flip math here. I've got them all listed. Cross sections that are squares and rectangles right there. So you can click on that 8.7 lesson and look over that if you're not sure what's going on. Okay, and the last part for number two, this is the weird one. Part Ds are usually the ones that are like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And a lot of kids just skip them. So here's how we do this. We've got this vertical line situation again, but this time this vertical line is moving. So it's moving across this thing. So here it's going to be longer and then here it'll be shorter and it'll get really, really short by the time it gets here. It is moving at a constant rate. It says here that it's going at seven units per second. We want to find the rate of change of the area. Hopefully some of you realize that this is a rate of change problem. Related rates, I should say, a related rates problem. So let's first write down what is the area, a formula for the area of a cross section. So remember, if we're doing a cross section, it's coming off the paper, kind of like what we did before, and it's creating a square. So the area of that is just f of x minus g of x, and then we square it. So the derivative of the area with respect to time is going to equal the derivative of this thing and then times dx dt. So you remember that because we're doing it with respect to time. If it was with respect to x, it would just be the derivative of this so that you do the chain rule and all this stuff. But we don't have to do this by hand. The first time I did this problem, I did it by hand. I brought the two down, did the derivative of f and g and all these things. And then I realized, whoa, whoa, we're using a calculator. So really all we have to do is the derivative of this, which since we're gonna use the calculator, I can just say dA dx. So it's the derivative of a with respect to x. And then we times that by, and this is implicit differentiation. And then you're gonna have dx dt. So what do we know of these things? We can, oh, at the point, I should say, at 
x equals negative 0.5. Now it says here that the line is moving at a constant rate of seven units per second. So that is my dx dt, that represents seven. So what I can do with a calculator is I can just do the derivative of this whole thing at x equals negative 0.5 and then whatever that answer is times it by seven. So the setup looks like this. So I have my quantity y1 minus y2, I'm taking the derivative of it, that quantity squared, and I'm evaluating the derivative at negative 0.5. When I plug that in as my answer, then I have to multiply that because that's just my dA dx. I multiply it by the rate of change of the x values, which was seven, multiply by seven, and we get negative 9.2718, or if you were rounding it, negative 9.272, if you wanted to round it up. All right, that, so that's the answer how to do this one, and that, lesson was from 4.5. 4.5's lesson was right there, solving related rates problems. So you got 4.4 introduction of related rates, setting them up, and then solving them. Okay, hopefully that made sense to you as you're working through number two from the 2022 calculus-free response question for AB Calculus.